is that no matter how much evil there is, and as you said, there is evil in the world, but in every single instance, the amount of good that I've seen is far overwhelming. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's overwhelming in a way that's kind of shocking. And that's been a defining feature that I've seen in some of the worst places on earth. It's an extraordinary privilege and just a fluky set of circumstances that means that I'm in Europe and have this opportunity to talk to Daniel Wordsworth. Uh, Daniel Wordsworth is the CEO of World Vision, but prior to that, he was in the Royal Australian Navy and then has spent many years of his life uh, on the front line where there's conflict and humanitarian crises uh, and misery trying to help people through difficult times. Uh, in that sense, uh, he's a very admirable person. Uh, and he's been spending time in his role with World Vision in Ukraine, quite apart from the really serious uh, issues that it raises in geopolitical terms. It is, of course, a horrendous refugee crisis, certainly the worst, I think, that Europe has seen since 1945. So it's a great pleasure to turn to Daniel here from London. Well, Daniel, it's tremendous to have the opportunity to talk to you. Plainly what's happening in the Ukraine is enormously challenging in all sorts of military and geopolitical senses, but it's also a horrendous humanitarian disaster. Just the raw figures, I understand around 5 million refugees have already fled the Ukraine. Perhaps 7 million are displaced or homeless. An unbelievable half of Ukrainian children are now displaced from their homes. You've seen an awful lot of conflict and disruption, but have you ever seen anything like this? Well, that statistic that you said there, that half of the children of the country are now displaced and have lost their homes, I've never seen that before. That's, um, I have to think that's unprecedented. It's incredibly devastating at sort of every level. Um, it's actually devastating in a much even deeper way than you'd think for children. It's it's devastating, a little in the communities. I, you know, walking around Kiev, that statistic becomes very real to you when you notice the lack of children on the streets. And it's just something you're not used to. It's dreadful. The other thing that I think is unprecedented about this crisis is the speed of movement. We had the European refugee crisis, if you remember, in 2015. And we had a million Syrians and Afghans moving into Europe in that year. And at the time, we were, um, you know, uh, staggered by that number. In the first five weeks of this crisis, it's been one million people crossing the border every week. Um, so these, these numbers are astounding. Uh, <clears throat> with the Russians withdrawing to some extent uh, to the east and the south now, are you seeing some people able to return? We've had reports in Australia of some people going back to Kiev, the capital. There are reports of this, and certainly this is happening on, at the borders. No one knows yet how permanent that is. Um, what was happening, we know, over the Easter break was that some people were take, taking that opportunity to go back home, go back to their farms, uh, collect other goods, actually, um, to you know, protect what they have, to check in. Um, so we know that was happening. We know that some people, um, you know, took their, their parents out of the country, took their children out of the country. But I know I spoke to one young woman who was desperate to come back and fight. And so you also had sort of people leaving the more vulnerable members of their family and then coming back in. But I'll also say I did the drive. It's about 500 kilometers um, from, you know, near the Romanian border to Kiev. It's meant to take about seven hours. It took us 12 hours. Now, part of that is because of blown out bridges, uh, constant military checkpoints. But there was a lot of traffic on the road. And so I do think there is movement back to Kiev. So can I ask you a, a couple of, um, do you have any thoughts? You know, the amazing thing to me is that um, uh, President Putin described in very detailed language the agonies that his own parents went through during the war with Germany. Uh, 
he must have some idea of what his so-called special military operation is visiting uh, upon, uh, uh, you know, innocent women and children, let alone th those that he's fighting. Well, I mean, you've moved more in the corridors of power than I have, sir. So I, I don't know what happens to a person over time in that kind of environment. I don't think there's an excuse for what's going on because of his personal heritage. But I think that connection is not being made. I think those um, issues around empathy that are so clear to us seem to be absent in some places. Yeah. And, and on the, the men of military age are not allowed to leave, are they? So it's only very elderly men. I take it the rest are women and children. Men uh, 18 to 60, you have to stay inside Ukraine. And so the men that are leaving are over 60. So it's mostly men that are staying. You still see a lot of women. Um, but, you know, the bulk of those refugees, those 5 million. I mean, I was on the border, I think, three days after the invasion. Three, three or four days, and I stood there in the snow watching um, mums carrying their children. What really stood out to me at the time was the number of patrollers. It's just something I'm not used to seeing. Uh, again, as you've said, I've been involved in almost every major movement of people for the last 25 years, um, and yet standing on that border in the snow uh, watching mums with no um, dads carrying a child, pushing a stroller um, just with a small backpack, uh, that was something to sort of be told at the time. Yeah. Do you gain anything of a feeling <clears throat> and why the Ukrainian people are so determined to preserve their homeland? Because they are paying an incredible price for it. It's very inspiring to us uh, in the West, but I find myself wondering whether we understand the value uh, of our own freedoms and our own national sovereignty because they really are throwing out the challenge. It's not just the personal pain, the agony of wondering whether your children are going to survive, of the separations involved, of the real fear for your physical safety, the disruption to your homeland. They're prepared to risk a very great deal. What drives Ukrainians to display this courage and determination, do you think? It's, it's um, I try to think about this actually. Because as, you, as you've said, the Ukrainians have been kind of this example of human spirit that I think has shocked us all um, in this, sort of in Europe. Their resilience, strength of character, their sheer guts and grit in the face of all of this, their willingness to, you know, destroy hundreds of bridges in their own country. I talked to one um, young mum uh, at the border in Romania. She was with a child, eight years old. She said the morning that they left, her husband came out. She came out with the child. He kissed them both goodbye. He went east to fight. She went west with her child. And she wanted to go with him. But because of their child, they made the decision that the child would be the focus. They'd make sure their, their, um, you know, their baby got through. And so she went west and came out and crossed the border. These are um, you know, big decisions. But, but I, actually, I think that human beings are like this. I just think we're all like this. I, I, I just think we most of us don't get the chance to plumb those depths in ourselves. I, I think what I'm seeing here is just real humanity. You know, one of the things that I really love about the Ukrainians, actually, is that you have this picture of them as this sort of unstoppable force now. But when you meet them and spend time with them, you realize that fundamentally their nature is sweet. They're just the gentlest, kindest people. And I, I'm not trying to be, it's really like that. Uh, when you're with them. And so it's like this juxtaposition that you see with Ukrainians. The other thing to also keep in mind is that, you know, mums and dads are like mums and dads everywhere. In front of your children, you want to be strong. And so often when I, when I was watching these mums carrying their kids, I thought, how, look how they looked like they were just going to hail a taxi. You know, like they're pushing in the, through the streets of Sydney trying to get to a taxi cab. But then I realized, no, they're, they're, just, they're just holding it together for the sake of their children. I mean, you know, know what's really going on inside but actually i believe in all of us and i believe in australians and i think if we were confronted by the same things i'd like to believe that we would step up in the same way well on that point you know you're really confronted with the conundrum of good and evil the thing that never goes away you could say that in reinforcing what you've just said that the west which for a long time has been so comfortable 
uh, and even started to say, well, everything's relative. There's nobody that's really bad. Evil's non-existent. And people do say that. I mean, uh, you know, some very senior Europeans, when George Bush described 9-11 as an act of evil, said, oh, what is this notion of evil? We, we sophisticated one very senior member, I can remember, the Frenchman it was, a very senior uh, we, we Europeans are long past the point of thinking of good and evil. This brings it to life. And to reinforce what you're saying, what's interesting, particularly in Eastern Europe, is that the rest of Europe and America and the world has pulled together in a way that must have been a great shock to President Putin and an enormous, uh, I guess, heartwarming for the rest of us. There's solidarity there that perhaps we didn't expect. Absolutely, absolutely. No one gets past evil. You, you uh, it's ever present. I don't think we've. It has not been so easily apparent to many of us as it is now. It's not that it's ever been away. I've spent my whole life um, with these mm. things. Um, I, I, I will say, um, I just sat in a meeting with the mayor of the city that I'm in, and with former prime minister, actually of. Ukraine. And we were talking about, you know, World Vision was here and we were wanting to work with children and we're committed to children and families. And both the mayor and the former prime minister were at pains to tell me about how dangerous this was for Europe and how there were some Australians that unfortunately lost their lives in the, if you remember the Malaysian Airlines, um, you know, uh, yes. missile attack. <clears throat> and at one point I just stopped him and I said, it's okay. Yeah. We're not here because of Australia. We're here because of you. Yeah. We're here because of your children. We're here because we care about you. We're here because of our shared humanity. And we get to do this. Yeah. You don't have to like justify passion or idealism. You don't have to. Yeah. I do think I've also noticed in the last 10 years, this notion that when a person is idealistic or a do-gooder, that we look down on that. I have um, proudly worn that badge for my whole life. I'm a proud do-gooder. I'm a proud idealist. I love being able to come to a situation like this and do good in it. And I've committed my whole life to that. And there's, um, as far as I'm concerned, nothing better you can do. Um, well, we might come back to that in a moment. I'd just like to explore that and what World Vision does and who, you know, in, in a moment. But before we do, those um, countries that are right on the interface, they've had a different perspective because many of them have been through very tough times. Take Poland. They've taken the brunt uh, of... Uh, the, 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 the people seeking safety, an extraordinary number of people, um, rather remarkable because they're not terribly well off themselves. How are they coping? It's hard for me, John, to speak to Poland. Um, the country that I know most about in, in relation to this crisis is Romania, and I've spent some time there, and we have a large presence in Romania, and so we're with Romanians. And I was just with... Um, uh, a Romanian family, actually, that had taken a refugee and just before I came into Ukraine on this trip. I, I think what's happening in Moldova, what's happening in Romania, what ha was happening in Poland, very similar. Uh, actually, it's Moldova that's taking the most refugees um, per head of capita, if you like, and I think most people wouldn't even know where Moldova is. They probably think it's a character from The Lord of the Rings, um, the, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <clears throat> but um, how are they coping? You know, I had a very real example of this. Early on in Romania, the first week that I was here after the crisis, the first day I arrived, around 10,000 people were crossing into Romania. By a week, the end of the first week, it was 95,000. And I was in a town called Soret. And this is a town that was experiencing this sort of flow of people coming in. And again, it's, it's winter, it's freezing, it's, it's blizzarding down with snow. You have thousands of people crossing the border. Um, and I sat with the mayor of that town and I asked, I just basically said to him, what do you need from us? You know, World Vision's here. We want to help. Uh, we're good at this stuff. What do you need? And he looked at me and laughed and just said, I've never done anything like this in my life. I, I was hoping you could tell me what I need. Yep. So I began, you know, walking him through some of those things. And his phone was buzzing and he stopped me and he said, actually, he said, I have a friend who's a hospital administrator. He's inside Ukraine. He keeps messaging me. They have refugees arriving on their doorstep. They can't even look after their own patients. They run out of medical supplies. They run out of food. They don't have enough blankets and mattresses. He said, don't worry about us. He said, if you want to do something to help, get 
food and supplies to that hospital as quickly as you possibly can. And we did it. We did it within 48 hours. But what jumped out at me was he, he was in need himself. His own city was in need. And yet he was looking over the border at the people of Ukraine. Uh, I, I think what's happening now in this environment is giving all of us a bit of a shock in a good way. You know, I think you alluded to that. I, I, I don't think people realized that humans could step up in the way that we're all stepping up and, do, and doing the things that we're doing. And it's, it's, that's been, I think, the defining experience of my life, working in these things for more than 25 years, is that no matter how much evil there is, and as you said, there is evil in the world, but in every single instance, the amount of good that I've seen is far overwhelming. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's overwhelming in a way that's kind of shocking. And that's been a defining feature that I've seen in some of the worst places on earth. What, um, <clears throat> what's your view on the, the reality? I think you'd, be, uh, you'd know more about this than me, but typically people we call refugees don't return to their homeland once they've sort of crossed the border, so to speak across the Rubicon. Given that most of the Ukrainian refugees are just across the national border there, is it, in your view, likely that they'll return home after this, this war? I mean, some of them will find their homes and their villages, their towns, even their cities are just complete rubble, yet their country's going to need them. Yeah, I, I think this is a... Um, this, I believe this will be decided in the next three to six months. What's happened is actually the people that, these first waves that went into Poland, Romania, Moldova, most of them actually kept on going. So most of those 5 million are actually scattered throughout Europe. They're staying with family, friends. These are people with some assets. And so they've moved out. Um, and right now they're sort of waiting. You then have this, this other number uh, that are sitting around the edges of Ukraine. This, this is the sort of 7 million that I think you alluded to also earlier on. That are just, they're near the border, so they're, they're sort of ready, and if they need to, they can get out, but otherwise they're trying to stay in the country. All eyes are on what happens in the next three or six months. And you called it crossing the Rubicon. I, I walked back, the first time I went to Ukraine, I walked back into Romania, and I was and I but this, this little stretch of no man's land between these two countries, only about 100 meters. And I was walking through it with a whole sort of group of families. And I was looking at each of them and I thought, this is, this is, it's only a hundred meters to leave your country. But for most refugees, it's an entire lifetime to get back. And whether and what happens, I think will be decided in the next three or six months, because that's when people start making major decisions because they have to for their children. And uh, the average stay uh, for a person in a refugee settlement is 15 years. Most refugees never get to go home. And this will tear the heart and soul out of this country. We're talking about huge numbers. We're talking about half, as I said, the children of the country. Um, not all of those across the border yet. So you're right. Uh, future, who and what Ukraine is in the future will depend on the sort of souls and the spirits of the people that stay behind and those that return. Would it be helpful to avoid the, the term refugee? I met, the, I met the ambassador for Ukraine and Australia, and he said, please don't say refugee. You know, call them anything. Call them, I, I don't remember the exact word. He actually gave me a suggested word. He said, we don't want them to be refugees. Refugees never come home. Uh, I mean, the only thing that's useful about refugee is that almost everybody around the world understands that refugees don't choose to be refugees. You know, they're not migrants in that sense. They're not choosing this. This is a choice that is being forced upon them. And um, that's why that phrase is important. Uh, the word is important. But you're right, it can create its own barriers. Um, the really horrendous, horrendous news around innocent people who are not soldiers, so to speak, or, or, or military people uh, being targeted even, uh, does raise this sort of uglier side of all, of, of man's inhumanity to man, if I can put it that way. I understand one of your principal concerns has been to try and make sure those so-called safe corridors work so that uh, Ukrainians who are not military personnel can escape to safe uh, places 
or safer countries, depending on what they are. What's involved in creating these corridors? Who, who protects the civilians? Does it involve cooperation with the Russian army or the people uh, looking for yes, protection from does. armed Ukrainians? It's not. In this context, it doesn't require any protection from armed Ukrainians. But what it, these are the sort of things that are, you know, this is one of those roles that the UN plays really well. You know, this is you know, a big part of what the UN is for in these moments, is to be sitting with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to be sitting uh, with the U Ukrainian ministry, and to be, you know, sort of allocating these on a map and saying, okay, can we agree? What does it mean? What's the time? How long will it go for? Um, you know, what are the parameters of this? And that's what the UN does. And uh, and then organizations like us then and uh, Red Cross and others can then utilize those safe corridors. It allows us to get into cities, for example, to do evacuations. It allows us to know where, um, you know, refugees and people are flowing out to. Uh, alongside of a safe corridor, which is like a passage, you have to also create safe you know, environments in a country. And so you might say, well, in the Western part of Ukraine, for example, if there are 7 million people that have been displaced, that's huge. Right? That's a, you have to create settlements that would take in entirely the people of Sydney and Newcastle and probably Wollongong all combined. And so you've got to create environments that are safe and where everybody agrees. We're not going to fight in those spaces. There's going to be no politics in those spaces. There's no recruitment in those spaces. They're purely humanitarian spaces where people can create, like us, can create mini cities um, where people can be cared for until all of this is sorted out. And, and stepping on one from that, are you aware, I, I think I've recently seen a reference to a truly tragic situation, a kidnapping. Uh, do, do you, are you aware of people exploiting this terrible situation, uh, kidnapping displaced and orphaned children? Have you seen any of that? Uh, for World Vision, I, I, we haven't we haven't seen any of that anything any sort of anything like that happening. It's a big concern for us. We call that trafficking, and so trafficking of women and children very big concern. Uh, that has to be managed at the border. The, the, I think why a lot of us are worried is that this is a, a sort of a long used uh, trafficking route, Ukraine, Romania, and a few other. There's a sort of an established criminal element uh, in that environment. Uh, so it's a concern. Uh, organizations like World Vision look into it. So, for example, what we will do is um, there, early on we received, there was an orphanage that was destroyed. Ukraine still has an orphanage kind of um, institutional setup for children who have lost their parents. In Australia, we put them into foster homes, we look after them different ways. But in Ukraine, they still have orphanages. And one of those orphanages was destroyed in Kiev. And we actually helped the Romanian authorities to take those orphans from Ukraine, put them into the Romanian system in a way that identified them, protected them, safeguarded them, and made sure they got settled into homes because they're transitioning from an institutional setting into a more home-based setting in Romania. So we help with things like that. Uh, but it is a concern. I would say right now, the violence that is being enacted on civilians is so appalling that um, that's got to be our focus. But again, we do not turn away from that. And we have systems in place to check it. But right now we're in this sort of brute force, brute force phase. Yeah, it sounds terrible. Um, one of the aspects that hasn't perhaps received a great deal of attention yet, in my view, is that Ukraine it was the breadbasket of Europe until the Bolsheviks destroyed everything uh, after uh, they took power in Russia and uh, shortly after the, the First World War, towards the end of the First World War. Uh, it has become a breadbasket again, very productive agricultural land. You and I are both from uh, rural areas, productive rural areas of, of Australia. Um, and, and we look with envy on their capability, they, they have rich soils, they're um, rainfall and so forth. Um, and they're the fifth largest grain exporter, I think, or have been over in recent years, Australia's the sixth. I think there are potentially some really difficult extensions of this disaster, humanitarian disaster, with both availability and the affordability of, of grains in particular, 
especially in Africa, where a lot of Ukrainian grain went. You're absolutely right on a whole bunch of levels. I do. I've been there driving on looking at all this dark soil coming from Tamworth. I'm thinking, wow, you know, we never ever had soil that dark. Um, so I think uh, the combination of Russia and Ukraine produce about 30% of the globe's wheat. Um, being from Tamworth, wheat was our, you know, our thing. Um, what, we were already wanting, what was, before this crisis emerged, there was already a food crisis that existed. There was already one. The a large part of this, apart from the standard issues that cause food insecurity, in parts of Africa, such as climate and uh, drought and locusts that are existing in East Africa right now, causing huge problems. Uh, alongside of that, we had COVID. And what COVID did is it slowed down production enormously. It slowed down supply chains, it slowed down actual production, slowed down movements of people. It reduced economic activity in large parts of the world. So people are basically at the end of COVID, we had less production, we had slimmer and weaker supply chain. We had less money in the economy and in people's pockets. And we were already warning of around, uh, you know, of a hunger crisis that was emerging for, um, I think, around 150 million people uh, globally. We were seeing this in East Africa. We were seeing this in Afghanistan. We were seeing this in parts of Asia. We were already warning of this to this crisis. Now you have one of the major suppliers of that part of the world, actually, Africa. I think Somalia, I think something like 65% of the wheat that it purchases, it purchases from Ukraine. Somalia is ground zero for something like famine and hunger in the eastern part of uh, Africa. And so you're right, prices are going to go up. Uh, we expect them substantively. They'll go up around the world, but they'll hit those areas hardest. Production is down. There's going to be less food available. Uh, the World Food Program is already saying that we are taking away food from the hungry to give to the starving. Um, this is likely what we're going to see happen. Uh, so we're in the, it's back in the middle of this, and we're certainly advocating with the Australian government uh, to please commit to a package around hunger, because we've learned, if nothing else, over the last 10 years, we're all connected, and uh, leadership matters, and uh, we have a chance to do something about it. Well, uh, well put. Uh, talking of leadership, uh, you've developed a great deal of expertise here. You've been working in this uh, area of conflict and the impact on people. For the last 25 years, uh, you joined World Vision only last year. Tell us about World Vision uh, and how, why, why you're keen to head it up. Because when we think of international relief efforts, we tend, I suppose, to think of governments. We think of uh, UNICEF, uh, you know, the big, well-known institutional assistance. But World Vision is a pretty potent force. Uh, people are pretty much aware of it. But, but, but why, why you, when you're an expert in this area, why, and why World Vision? Because I'd like then to suggest that people might like to think about financially supporting you. Thank you. Actually, I get so excited about this one. Um, I, feel like, uh, I feel like the dog that's caught the bus, right? Is that the expression? The dog that's caught yes. the bus? The do you know, the dog that's caught the car? Whatever it is. Yeah. I feel like yeah. I'm that person. Uh, I spent my whole life trying to do good. Yeah. Most of that time is, I've been like the Dutch boy. Yeah. I go to all these things and I'm just trying to make people, help people suffer less. Yeah, that's, that, that's my normal, for 25 years, been my normal day to day life. Yeah. How do I make what is truly an appalling situation better for children and families? And you can do that. You know, you can do that. And I have done that. And I've seen that happen many, many times. But, but at some point, you want to actually change the world. Yeah, and you, and you're you're right, but I think you're underselling World Vision. So I get the chance to like um, you know say I'll be it. World Vision is the largest charity in the world. It's the largest charity in the world. The and largest, right. you, uh, you know, the the largest in the world. The UN, by a long margin, actually, by a huge margin. Uh, UNICEF and the UN, they their government organizations. Even the Red Cross is an international organization. You know it. They're a multilateral uh, organization. They're all part of the government institutional system. They sort of represent the sort of these, um, you know, the power brokers of the world. World Vision, we represent everybody else. We're the 99%. We're the average everyday person. I, I, I love it so much. You know, as the, you know, you say you're the largest charity in the world. What that really means is you're the largest force for good driven by everyday people on earth. 
And then when you think about that, this gives me like tingles down my spine. If you're that now, it means you're the largest force for good driven by everyday people that has ever existed. And that's what vision at this moment of time. And we believe that we're actually called to be here. You know, we believe that we actually sort of represent the hands and feet of Jesus on earth, right? And so, of course, we would be that, yeah. And then you take that. So how often in your life do you get to actually say, I have the resources and the power to change the world? It's very rare. I've had for many years the resources and the power to change a child's life, a family's life, a village life, maybe you're even a refugee camp, but I've never had the chance to change the world. And then when I, then in Australia, World Vision Australia is, is one of them, I think the most unique NGO in the world, because World Vision Australia is part of the fabric of the Australian experience. Uh, how many Australians do you know that didn't discover a broader world through the World Vision's 40-hour famine? I, I don't know that I've ever met an Australian, actually, that either didn't do the 40-hour famine or didn't have a sister that did it or a friend that actually did it. It's like, a, it's like a rite of passage as a teenager to realize the world is bigger than you and you can do something about it. And then so many Australians, when they get their first job, they sponsor a child. And I think about that as a rite of passage of adulthood, right? You get your first paycheck and you think, I'm an adult now, what should I do? And then you think, well, part of being an adult is I should give back. And so they sponsor a child. And then later on, when you have your first child, this again is such a common experience in Australia. People sponsor a child because they want their child to grow up in tandem with a child in Tanzania, for example, to realize that, yes, we live in a lucky country and it's not so lucky for everybody. And so we're like this sort of rite of passage of goodness for the Australian people. And so when you combine those two things together, I want to see what does Australian idealism look like? What if in World Vision in Australia, we could mobilize this country to do good in the world in a way that was unprecedented? And what if we could apply Australian idealism to this big lever of change, which is World Vision in 100 countries? What would Australians do? And so taking on the reins of this organization, that's the question I've been asking everybody. And I'd even ask you, <laughs> if we could channel Australian idealism and actually change the world, what would we do? And the beautiful thing about this, John, is we can. Yeah, we can. And so that's why I took the job on. Well, I salute your leadership. That's the first point I'd make. Uh, you know, you, you, you're out there having a go in the Australian spirit, but in a way that actually demands courage. And I salute you for that. Uh, secondly, I would make the observation that uh, World Vision is plainly trusted. I know enough about how people feel about donating to know that they want to know their money's going to actually make a difference because the organisation can be trusted and it's well enough run not to swallow any more that needs to in overheads. I, I do feel confident to say that um, I can say to people, if you want to help, um, this is an ideal way to do it. If you feel uh, powerless to, uh, in the face of what's happening in the Ukraine, and you want to step up, here's an ideal way to do it. Uh, so, so Daniel, uh, I'll make that appeal. Uh, and uh, my wife and I'll do something about it. Um, other members of my family, I hope, will join me. And I'm hoping that those who listen to this or watch it, uh, whether they choose a video or podcast, will step up as well. And we'll make sure that the strap line's there so that people know how. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership.